Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session this morning in the spotlight product development in healthcare. My name is Muthu Singram. I'm the co-founder of Startup Podium and the curator for this program. This morning, we have a very interesting panel. We have with us three panels from Singapore, the United States and Australia, who share their, not, their experiences and knowledges in product development in healthcare. So we will start off this morning with Dr. Mary Khan, Program Director at the Singapore Biodesign ASTA. She will talk a little bit about herself and also how they go about uh, product design down at the Singapore Biodesign. Welcome, welcome Mary. And uh, Mary will go first, then Jeff, Jeff Champagne, and then Joe Portis will go last. And then we will take some questions from the audience. So Mary, over to you and uh, please uh, in, uh, introduce yourself and uh, over to you with the uh, your your presentation. Thank you, Mutu, and thanks for the invitation to speak on this panel. Uh, maybe I'll just share some slides first, and uh, we can get started. So, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Mary. I'm the program director at Singapore Biodesign, and I'm also the acting director for MedTech Diagnostics Digital Health at Enterprise A Star. So ASTAR is essentially the, um, one of the key research agencies in Singapore doing translational research. And we're under the Ministry of Trade and Industry umbrella. And so at Enterprise here, we are supposed to help with the tech transfer and commercialization of, um, of our products uh, from the research side uh, to, to industry. At Singapore Bar Design, uh, we are really a national training platform. We have partnered with Stanford Biodesign and we've had a 10-year history where we take the biodesign need-centric approach uh, to help bring training uh, to the local innovators so that they can accelerate their health technology innovation uh, for ages unmet healthcare needs. So I just wanted to give you a background of what we do. I think today's uh, sharing mostly focuses around uh, bio biodesign and the training in product development and how we uh, maybe think about um, approaching these uh, innovations for healthcare. So if you look at the biodesign methodology, which starts with identifying the clinical need, this uh, has always been uh, the mainstay of what we believe in, because uh, if we think about the need in mind, it actually becomes a market product fit. Uh, so this is what we emphasize a lot. And once we have identified the need, we go on into the invent phase, uh, which involves concept generation and concept screening. And finally, once we've decided on the correct uh, concept, that's where we will move into the implement phase, uh, where the product development strategy, the R&D strategy, clinical strategy, all comes into play. So out of this uh, methodology, uh, which originated at Stanford, uh, we can see obviously many, many outcomes uh, through companies that have been built, uh, jobs that are created, funding raised, as well as patients impacted. So this really, uh, goes through the whole innovation cycle of uh, you know getting companies out and then getting it adopted and hence it really is a win-win situation for the whole ecosystem and so at singapore biodesign uh, here in singapore we started for the last 10 years and really uh, focus on talent development first and so once we have more people trained and innovators trained uh the, the way that we see in singapore is uh, we don't have that many experienced uh, product engineers in the system because our ecosystem is fairly uh, young, right? Uh, about 10 years in the making. And so it really helps to have uh, the young innovators uh, get exposed uh, to this methodology and then learning on the job uh, through creating the innovations. And we believe that this will eventually help us to create the robust ecosystem. Obviously not without help with uh, the, the uh, international uh, network and industry that we have. Uh, so if we move directly into prototyping and uh, product development, I guess I'm going first in this uh, sharing today because I'm more on the training side and obviously coming in uh, very much more at the concept prototyping uh, because this is really where the innovations uh, originate from and the ideas start. Uh, so we really borrow from the concept of design thinking where we empathize uh, with the user. And so this is the part where uh, as opposed to normal uh, product development, uh, for healthcare, you really have to think about the user, right, and the clinical uh, advantage and the clinical outcomes that's required. And so this is the part of empathy and define that uh, we strongly believe needs to be done. And once this is done, uh, we go into the idea prototyping and testing phase where you could actually look at a plethora of concepts and ideas that fit the unmet clinical need. 
uh, but really it's this uh, iterative process that helps you to really then define your requirements. So if you look at this in totality from an early stage prototype going into the final product, right, uh, we again uh, felt that you know, this kind of process is not a linear process as opposed to what many people think, right? That you come up with requirements and then you design for it, then you build and then you test. Uh, but really, this is not linear and it's really iterative. And we felt that the faster that you do this uh, with a very small budget, uh, the quicker you'll get to your, to your final product. So that's all the learnings that we've had and we try and encourage and, um, you know, the young innovators to think about. So at Singapore Biodesign, we have mapped out all the various um, product development activities with regards to design, development, build and test. And of course, complementing it with the business needs, right? The user requirements and the business needs. And here's where we have focused on trying to get this right from the start. Uh, so we have, we have seen many companies, you know, come in with a product in mind, a technology in mind, uh, you know, trying to do the ISO 1345 and design development, uh, but essentially, did not have a lot of these requirements or the user needs well spec'd out. And that has led to a lot of problems and maybe a lack of funding for the company uh, eventually. Uh, so which is why, again, we're trying to target right at the start so that uh, we can try and give the correct framework. So if you look at this, uh, we try and define a concept-based prototyping versus a design and development phase uh, prototyping because uh, I think the general innovators that we see here have a misconception that Oh, as long as the technology is viable, it means that um, you have a good product. But actually, that's on the contrary, because a, a viable product initially is really just a test for the technology and the feasibility. But really, in implementing it really looks at usability, you know, the cost of manufacturing and really adoption back into the current patient workflow. So there is a lot that needs to be considered beyond just this yellow um, circle. And now we are trying to teach more of the downstream blue circle so that our researchers and innovators can think further ahead towards the design and development. So really, uh, I think what we wanted to say is let's design the right product first with concept prototyping, do it quickly and get it out of the way, and then design the product right once you get the requirements. Uh, so here we have created a very simple storyboard. I think for the experienced product engineers in the room, uh, this is really very easy for you. Uh, but for some of the innovators or researchers who have never really been exposed to uh, correct, uh, you know, D and D or B and B activities, even ISO thirteen forty five uh, quality management systems are really quite daunting for them. Uh, so that's where we have tried to simplify it, and uh, we teach it in a very structured manner. And so, uh, but what, what we really try and do is if you're involved in any form of healthcare technology innovation, is to learn about the key regulations and the key uh, quality management systems first, right? So think of it and apply the strictest requirements to yourself, right? And then if you go into maybe lower risk products uh, and then also into consumer products, then you could then relax those rules. But it's very important to know about this framework right from the start. And that's where we, we decided to create this and also to inform people right at the start. So the ISO 3045, design controls, coming up with customer needs, user requirements, design requirements before going into the whole product development phase. Um, so I just want to end with some examples and conclusion. Uh, really, is uh, we find that the design thinking approach and how we have um, you know, talked about uh, quick prototyping, eventually moving the product development, actually works uh, very well for medical devices, digital health and diagnostics, because there's always some form of user uh, requirements here that the technical does not uh, sometimes solve, right? So that's where the needs uh, basis is important. Uh, if you look at this, I just wanted to give an example of how someone uh, quickly prototype and then got the product out. So this is uh, Michael. Um, he actually is a US a biodesign alumni. And he, he actually founded Oculif, uh, one of the uh, companies for dry eye. And his initial solution was really to look at how he could stimulate the lacrimal gland uh, from an implantable that is in his, uh, at the corner of the eye. But as they went about the prototyping and creating a few iterations, they realized that, oh, you know, this is going to become implantable. It could be quite tough in terms of regulatory. Uh, but eventually they stumble upon this way or new novel mechanism to stimulate the lacrimal gland from the intranasal uh, passage. And so then it became very quickly a non-invasive, uh, quick to market type of uh, solution. So this is one of those. Uh, the second one I wanted to highlight is really uh, how you could also use uh, prototyping quickly uh, for emerging markets. So using a low cost 
a way to do that. So if you look at uh, George Odon, uh, what he did was he was trying to, uh, you know, solve for a problem to assist vaginal birth uh, through labor without uh, avoiding the comp complications of labor, right? And so he took a reference from this uh, wine bottle and trying to extract a cork and then uh, created a bag that was, uh, kind of uh, replicates this mechanism. And it's a very simple, low-cost device that can be used uh, you know, in um, emerging countries and rural areas. And so this is something that was uh, pushed through World Health Organization uh, to, to roll out implement. In this uh, case study here with uh, Joel Goldstein, he actually is also a US Biodesign Fellow and then went into Abbott and so was very involved in the continuous glucose monitoring. But as you go about it and you realize the latest user needs and technological requirements, uh, he, it became very apparent that they needed a software uh, a com companion. And that's where they decide to partner with Bigfoot Medical uh, to inform or uh, auto-titrate uh, insulin delivery. So these are just all ways uh, that you could apply a process if you think thought about it and the needs and uh, how you would build the product. Uh, this would then come about uh, very naturally on how you could build on uh, a one product to become more of an effective product or eventually creating a product pipeline. So in Singapore, our alumni have uh, really gone on to utilize the methodology and you know, they've created different <laughs> devices. Uh, they're still not you know, well-named devices, but really at least meet the needs here in Singapore. Uh, so we have, you know, class two uh, devices, we have healthcare services, we have consumer products, we even have those for emergency services. Uh, so that's just a sample of how some of the alumni have really brought this through in their 10 years of history together with the maturing ecosystem here with grant funding and all that. Uh, we are starting to see quite a bit of these innovations come up. And in Singapore, uh, this year particularly, uh, COVID-19 has, you know, in a way been a blessing for us. It has brought the whole Singapore community together, uh, sourcing for uh, supplies and creating innovations uh, within uh, Singapore. And so these are just uh, but some of the um, you know, key innovations that came out through COVID. Some are obviously uh, you know, diagnostic kits, some um, uh, accessory products and all that. Uh, but generally all you know, uh, brought through a quick uh, concept prototyping product development and eventually market adoption status. And so I think we're very proud that uh, Singapore has grown in this area and we're looking forward to more of this. Uh, so in conclusion, I just wanted to say that as you think about product development, please do not um, uh, forsake the identify phase or the implement phase and uh, do think quickly about your requirements, right? And then for certain of these products that you're trying to create, uh, look at whether it should be in-house or outsourced and uh, get updated on the regulatory requirements because that changes and that will inform what you need to do for your product. So I'll stop here and thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, Mary, for a wonderful presentation. Now I, I, I will welcome Je Jeffrey Champagne to sp uh, share his experiences. Uh, Jeffrey, you're ready to go and just, just give a quick introduction of yourself as well, Jeffrey. I don't want to short, I don't want to short sell you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Mudu. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, brilliant. Fantastic. Go okay, forward. excellent. Well, thank, thank you for having me today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. That was, that was great. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, your approach. And I'm going to echo some of the things that Dr. Khan said um, in, in my presentation. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so my background is in early and emerging disruptive technologies. I spent the last 12 years in medical device, uh, first on the R side of things and then on the D side. Um, today, I'm the general manager of emerging categories for Kohler Company, which is a privately held 147-year-old company based in Kohler, Wisconsin. Um, I recently joined the company to, uh, to head up the development of a new division. Uh, they're, we're calling it emerging categories, but it includes smart home and med tech. I can't really talk a whole lot about what the company is doing, um, but if you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, to put an NDA in place and we could talk about how we could collaborate. Um, my, my philosophy in medical device development um, has always been really user needs and, and unmet needs based. Um, so looking at the patient as the center of all the activity, um, I'm, I'm a big believer that the, the most uh, when it comes to new medical technology is always the patient. Um, I work with a lot of small and large companies over the past uh, 12 years. Uh, before that, I was in, in kind of new product development and, and marketing and sales. 
uh, for the last 20 years. But um, what it always comes down to is the customer centricity or the patient centricity. And um, as a patient myself, I can tell tell you that um, you know it's always in those those dire moments um, where kind of things seem hopeless or there's just got to be a better way to deal with um, getting better or getting well. And I've, I've unfortunately had to experience that firsthand myself in a number of cases, uh, but also in the cases of uh, either individuals I was caring for or, um, you know, parents. I got into healthcare um, quite a long time ago. My mother was a, a, an imaging technologist, so she was in x-ray uh, when I was born, and then in the 80s got into um, MRI technology and then be- went back to school and became a nurse. So um, I was always around uh, imaging around x-ray, around MRI uh, growing up. I'd see you know, MRI images on the dining room table as a kid, or I'd go visit my mother um, at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut and um, get to you know, scan through uh, a patient's brain, and that really just fascinated me. So I've always been uh, interested in, in how we can improve healthcare and, um, and do things better. I recently came from a, an engineering firm called NPR Associates based in Alexandria, Virginia, and um, I spent the last seven years there as the uh, senior, as the director of business development. So I got to work with a lot of companies, uh, starting relationships from the very beginning uh, with physician entrepreneurs or with large, you know, um, front office players in C suites for large medical device companies. And um, you know, one thing is is common among all those experiences is that those that set out to solve unmet needs or those that set out to, um, you know, put that patient first. Uh, typically, um, you know, do do much better in performance for that device in terms of revenue and sales and all that good stuff, but also uh, in the market adoption. Uh, I'm a big believer in designing the right value propositions for stakeholders early on in the process. And today I'm going to share a little bit about my perspective on, on kind of value proposition design. Uh, there's a great book called Strategy. Uh, there's a great company actually called Strategizer, uh, and they put out books on new value proposition design. So I'm going to take some excerpts from that kind of way of looking at medical device development and, uh, and share with you a few examples today. Um, before my uh, experience at the engineering firm in Alexandria, I was with a research and advisory firm called NIRAC down by the University of Connecticut. Um, NIRAC was uh, an advisory firm that was set up by NASA and the, um, uh, the University of Connecticut back in the 1960s to support the Apollo mission. They were our grandparents. Google, if you will. So if you needed information about patents or if you needed information about uh, competitive materials or uh, companies or, um, you know, things to incorporate in your IP uh, strategy, uh, you'd reach out to NIRAC. Uh, A lot of people had subscriptions there. And I was there starting in 2007 to about 2013, again, business development. So I got to build relationships with, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of companies, uh, understand what they were trying to accomplish and then help them with those goals. So it was kind of drinking from the fire hose for the last 12 years. And in doing so, you kind of get to see how it's done right and you get to see how it's done wrong. Um, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun when you get to interact with that many companies. Um, so what, what I want to show you now, I'm going to sh- just share this screen if that's okay. Um, and uh, hopefully I can make this a little bit bigger. Let's do this. Bear with me one sec. And I will share. Okay. So in sharing this, um, bear with me one sec, slideshow. So we're going to look at, um, you know, the way I look at everything right now is really based on the Affordable Care Act's definition of the triple aim, um, looking at ways of, of uh, improving the experience of care, um, looking at population health, how, we, how can we improve the population health, and also, uh, you know, how do we reduce the per capita cost of health care. So these are some big problems in healthcare today. All of those would be considered an unmet need or an opportunity for improvement in medical care. Um, And so that's what I usually start out with as a lens when I look at ways in which we can improve the current standard of care is uh, is cost experience and then the population health. Um, Today, you know, really looking at moving this continuum of care uh, from from the ICU and and really challenging places in the hospital and specialty clinics 
uh, down into the home, right? So uh, if we want to impact the quality of care and keeping people in their homes longer or just reducing the cost of healthcare, that's a great way to do it is, is move uh, to the left in this continuum and up in the quality of, of care as well. Um, so this is how I kind of look at things is how do we move things up into the, to the left here? Um, there's a number of different characteristics and great value proposition design. Um, this part of part of this is from strategizer, but also in kind of best practices over the years. Um, great value propositions are embedded in great business models, right? So we don't create a product and then figure out a home for it or figure out a solution, um, you know, or a market for something once the technology is built. Uh, we build it with that unmet need in mind and then fit it into the business model to to uh, to become successful. Uh, we focus on the jobs, pains, and gains that matter most to the customer. Uh, I'm going to show you a little um, uh, diagram here. This is this is directly from Strategizer. Um, Strategizer uses this value map and customer profile to, in order to define the jobs on the right that customers need to get done. So um, I'll give you an example. If you're a caregiver and you're that stakeholder as a caregiver, um, your job is to take care of that dependent um, and to provide gains over their current standard um, and then also to alleviate pains. Um, and those pain, pain relievers and gain creators get worked into the value proposition map uh, as you're creating those values and services. So as we talk through this, um, these are some of the terms that we're gonna talk about. Um, we're focused on unsatisfied jobs, things that are, are not being done well, either they're taking too long, they cost too much, uh, the results are, are insufficient. Uh, or there's unrealized gains that need to be realized. Um, we also target just a few of those jobs. We don't want to try to be everything to everyone as we as we create uh, new solutions for stakeholders. Um, typically, when I look at a device development, we first start to define those stakeholders, who are all the individuals that are going to either touch that product over the continuum of, of, of that product's life, uh, from unpackaging it, to reading the instructions, to installing it, to purchasing it, um, to um, you know, using it on a patient to um, retiring it and servicing it. And so we look at all those stakeholders that are going to touch that product over the course of its life. Uh, and then we figure out who is the key stakeholder that's going to determine, determine the value from this product uh, the most. And then we, we target the, the jobs that those individuals are trying to accomplish. Um, great value propositions also go beyond functional jobs. They address emotional and social jobs as well. Um, so they are looking at um, ways in which they can improve quality of life. Um, there are ways in which we can uh, alleviate stress from the patient or the caregiver or the doctor even or, or, or the hospital, right? Um, there's a lot of constraints and pressures that are coming from all angles. And if you can alleviate those, um, then, then you've designed a good product. Um, they also align with how the customers measure success. We look at what, are the, what does the customer have to accomplish, uh, what would success look like, and then we help them to get there. They focus on jobs, pains, and gains that a lot of people have, um, or that some will pay a lot of money for. So you've either got to have scale um, and the ability to reach a lot of people with that solution, or it's got to be a really special solution that solves a really, really big problem that that um, you know might might only impact a small population. They also differentiate from competition on on jobs, pains, and gains that customers care about. Um, they outperform outperform the competition. Typically, that's the standard of care, uh, substantially on at least one of the dimensions of that triple aim. So they're either going to drastically reduce costs, greatly increase the, the quality of experience, or um, really improve the, uh, the population's health. And then also, they're difficult to follow. So they're hard to co copy, either by um, defense and an IP strategy or uh, for other reasons, right? Um, one of the examples that, that was discussed earlier is, is you know, clearance and, and getting uh, an FDA approval. Well, if you have to do a PMA route or a de novo route um, and there's no predicate, that could be a bad thing because it might take longer, but it also puts up a substantial uh, roadblock in front of your competitors as they try to follow behind you quickly. Um, going through a PMA is, is intense, it's, it's expensive, uh, but it can also create a nice barrier uh, and make it difficult to copy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about risk reduction as well. Uh, risk reduction is one of my favorite um, kind of tools uh, being at a conservative engineering company. Um, actually, I'll tell you a little bit about the legacy of that company. Um, NPR Associates was um, uh, started in 1964, and it was um, the chief engineers from Ad Admiral Rickover's Nautilus program. So these individuals, Mandel, Panoff, and Rockwell, invented the nuclear submarine, 
uh, with Admiral Rickover, and they were his chief engineers. And then from there, they started an engineering firm to support the nuclear Navy over the course of the last 50 plus years. Um, so they also work on power plants and, and other things. But um, the main theme of, of NPR as an engineering firm, uh, which taught me a, a tremendous amount, was risk reduction. Uh, it's, it doesn't mean that you don't take risks. It means that you manage those risks appropriately and reduce them as early as possible in order to accelerate through a development. So NPR was really good at going, going fast, and they were really good at doing the impossible. But that meant looking at everything that could possibly go wrong over the course of that development, over the course of the life cycle of the product, and any way in which that product could be used, not just its indicated uses, but then reducing those risks or making sure none of those things ever happened. So that's one of the ways in which you can accelerate through a development and build something that's bulletproof uh, is to reduce all those challenges in the beginning uh, by designing them out of the product. Um, a lot of companies that I've run into over the years because I, I was brought in as a fixer, right? When people got a letter from the FDA or they got a warning letter or they got shut down, uh, they'd call my, my team and myself in uh, to fix the problem. And so um, I was there often in the room when things had gone sideways. Um, not not the cause of when things went sideways, but to go in and fix it. Uh, think of me like the wolf in Pulp Fiction that gets called in when things go wrong. Um, I know what to do, I know how to do it, and I know the team, and if you listen to me carefully, um, I'll get you to a solution. Um, but that's one of the challenges of, um, over the last 10 years, I've, I've had a lot of exposure to when things go sideways. And so being able to find out where the bodies are buried and who done it uh, is really important in getting things back on the track. Um, so let's, you know, when we're building things from scratch and you've got a clean sheet of paper, let's reduce that risk purposefully um, by beginning with the end in mind, uh, fully define what that product is going to be in the end, um, and then deconstruct the complex problems in individual solvable parts. So you're going to take your big rocks, those are the things that you're trying to solve and find solutions for, and you're going to break them up into smaller rocks that can be solved, and then build those things back up into um, systems um, that, that develop what we call a vertical slice. And that's every component of a system um, in, in a line functioning together as that system in a prototype mode. Um, so those, those vertical slices are very important in, in de-risking products so that you can then uh, drive out risk and, and uh, accelerate into your commercialization plan. So there's, there's a lot in that one slide alone, but um, that, that's one of the secrets to uh, engineering companies uh, like NPR uh, that understand risk. Uh, customer centricity is, is also the future of, of the industry and medical device. Uh, finding out what are those pains that individuals suffer from uh, as a part of their indication that they're dealing with or part of their uh, disease state, and then finding ways to alleviate those pains, and also doing so in their home, right? Um, this is a negative pressure wound therapy pump on that night table there, which you can see and that patient is being uh, using that for uh, wound therapy, right? So finding out how to make things easier for patients to do in their home instead of going to a clinic uh, is a big way in which we can focus on that customer. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's part of the secret uh, to, uh, to success as well is that centricity. Um, when we look at uh, this, this map from strategize around value proposition design, um, if you're able to fill in kind of what your product or service is, uh, what your customer uh, is and, and who that stakeholder is, what jobs they're trying to complete, what pains they're trying to realize and what gain, what, I'm sorry, what gains they're trying to realize and what pains they're trying to relieve, um, you can then take this model um, and build it into a statement of uh, kind of like an ad lib of, of how that value proposition is going to provide uh, either relief or some value uh, to the stakeholder. Um, so I really like this as an exercise and do these workshops quite often in order to kind of work through some of the problems, challenge assumptions, uh, and then build a product that's got the right value propositions and, and requirements defined early and upfront. Um, other trends that are happening in the, um, in the industry right now is um, population health management uh, is, is really becoming a part of the conversation and finding ways in which we can deliver real value to the population, right? So we're talking right now in the middle of, of a pandemic, um, you know, there's lots of conversations, not around just vaccines, uh, but antibodies and, and how those, those can help the population um, to develop immunity to uh, these challenges and also um, acute therapies in, in um, really dangerous situations for some of these patients. Um, th these are some of the ways in which in the future we'll be more prepared for the next pandemic uh, as we develop capabilities in producing antibodies. Um, 
there are um, a lot of different ways in which the continuum of care is extending into the home. And um, this just kind of walks through a couple different ways in which um, acute care is, is quickly becoming um, less dealt with in, in the clinics and more dealt with in the home. For example, the current administration um, is looking at ways to move uh, dialysis. Uh, by 2025, the, the current administration has written an, an executive order in the U.S. to say that 80 percent of dia dialysis should be done in the home by 2025. Now, that's a big ambitious goal, but there's several large companies that are sprinting towards that goal uh, in order to, to reduce the co cost of healthcare for these uh, critical kidney failure patients. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of examples of that right now. I think that's a great example of how regulation and also, um, you know, executive orders um, can, can be helpful um, in some circumstances um, to bring down the cost of care in, in our healthcare system. Um, some of the other things that are really important to think of when you're considering stakeholders is this new perception of value. Um, you know, purchasing used to rest with the doctors, used to be, you know, really controlled by the hospitals, also by the payers, uh, and really little was done or decided by the patient. Um, that paradigm is shifting. And so earlier, um, you know, now you'll see, you know, more uh, being done by the hospital uh, to control costs, more being done by the payers um, who have more responsibility as well in that relationship. Look at hospitals and readmittance, for example. <clears throat> um, today, if a patient goes into the hospital with a heart failure um, and they're diagnosed and they're, um, they're um, sent home, um, the, the hospital is also responsible for that patient over the next 30 days. And if they're readmitted for the same condition, uh, the hospital is then required and penalized uh, for sending them home in, in an unstable condition or, or seeing them come back. So that re readmittance is another way in which kind of regulation and, and, and um, government can help to reduce costs by holding accountable uh, the parties that are delivering care. Um, so we look also at, at ways in which companies can innovate around that model um, to either provide relief for the hospital in some way of managing patients' health from home uh, or monitoring that patient remotely and then triaging the patient before they go back into emergency care um, for the same condition. So um, seeing a lot of developments and technologies that are coming up now that are geared towards that readmittance relationship with the hospital. And so developing, um, developing products uh, and medical devices that help that hospital player um, to reduce their liability and to, um, to provide them with a bit of insurance is also really good. Um, one of the more popular technology um, developments today is are those that are being proven through clinical trials, right? Lots of pharma and biotech companies are also looking at uh, clinical evaluation tools uh, that are useful in uh, proving that their new therapy or new technology is effective uh, with a companion device that might um, might do some measurements um, and uh, provide a data set for um, for those clinical trials. So I've seen a lot of technologies that are being developed and also paid for and funded by pharma companies um, who are historically not, uh, not the best at med tech development, uh, but that are using these young entrepreneurs and uh, technology companies to prove um, their effectiveness and their safety uh, during clinical trials. And so these are some of the, some of the technology uh, trends that I've seen recently uh, that, are, that are becoming very popular and, um, and ways of getting to market, right? So if, um, if I'm a young entrepreneur and, and I want to bring a new technology to market, uh, partnering with a pharma company might be a great way to go about that. Um, they have access to funds. Um, they've got uh, important trials that need to go forward. Uh, and they're looking for data sets that help them improve the efficacy of their, of their results. So um, these are some ways in which uh, entrepreneurs are finding funding when the traditional angel route or you know, Series A financing might not be available um, as, as money is becoming um, uh, less available these days in, in those scenarios for med tech entrepreneurs. Um, we also look in, in that stakeholder design of, you know, how those stakeholders perceive value. Um, and so we look at the physician and, and the possibility of greater efficiency of uh, being able to perform more procedures during the course of a day, uh, shorter procedure durations, less time spent on paperwork, uh, more automated documentation and sent to the electronic health record. All of these things are, are things that make the physician's life easier. And so those would be major, major uh, value propositions for these stakeholders. 
combining multiple procedures into one uh, is also really important. Large companies today in the med tech space are looking for ways in which they can, for example, uh, image and treat all in the same endoscopy procedure. Um, so there's ways of cutting down on the churn uh, requirement to have patients come back for multiple visits. Um, and also, you know, just the time in, in, in uh, having a patient sedated. If you can do all in one, you can reduce risks, the patient experience gets better, and then you can also address more patients leading to better population health. So all of these things kind of play into each other as, as we're talking about, uh, you know, um, using the triple aim as a lens. And it's really helpful to stay focused uh, during the course of a med tech uh, development project. Um, patients, how do they see value? They improve their quality of life. Um, they find uh, reduced readmissions, procedure revisions, shorter stays, faster recovery. Um, think of it from the patient's perspective. It's not hard to, to line up value propositions, but in all of these cases, I think it's really important that you not only assume that these are value propositions that would be of value, but vet those with the patients, right? Talk to the patients that have gone through these procedures before um, and, uh, and also talk to the doctors that are performing these procedures. And there's always, um, there's always something that can be cut, something that can be reduced, uh, something that can be easier or a better experience. It's, it's pretty simple, uh, but it has to be significant. It can't just be an iteration of, of the current standard of care. It needs to be a significant leapfrog ahead of the current standard of care in order to turn heads and be adopted you know, successfully. Um, let's look a little bit at the hospital's uh, perceived uh, value for those stakeholders. Um, hospitals today, uh, anything they can do, as we mentioned, readmissions is, is a big uh, penalty for them. If they can reduce those re readmissions, um, they can cut their losses uh, significantly. Also, procedure revisions, if you can get a better um, you know, probability of success long term, um, you're going to make friends at the hospital. Shorter stays, faster recoveries, fewer complications, let's free up beds faster and turn turn rooms so that we can get more patients seen and, and, and more procedures done. Greater efficiency for the doctor, combining multiple procedures into one, um, as we mentioned, and also risk sharing in bundle payments. Um, finally, the payer sees value in shorter stays, uh, faster recoveries, fewer complications. I remember when um, you know, one, of, one of my children was born, uh, our insurance uh, company actually offered us uh, quite a substantial um, incentive to, to leave the hospital a day early. Everything was going well, uh, baby and mom were happy, and um, if we left early, I think there was a, a significant um, payout as a result of that um, because we saved them so much money in, a, in one day in the hospital stay. Uh, combining multiple procedures into one, again, that's also a value for, for payers, delivering care in a lower cost environment, i.e. the home, and then also improve patient compliance. Any, any way we can help to understand the patient is doing the therapy or the rehabilitation that they are. So that means that a lot of devices that are being sent into the home track how the, how the product is being used, if it's being used, where it's being used, when it's being used, and how it's being used. And so if you can track that device, if you have a, you know, um, sensors in the device that can track and, and report back to the, the payer, um, they're more likely to pay out, more likely to see the value in the, in the procedure, um, and they really like that kind of thing. So. These are some of the perceived values. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but um, just want to be cognizant of uh, you know time, and uh, I think that that's uh, that's where I'll leave off. So, Luthu, um, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to share, and happy to answer any questions that you might have today. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. And it's uh, Joe's turn now. Joe, go ahead and uh, Joe, just please introduce yourself so I don't short sell you, as I say. And you're on mute, the most famous word for the year. This is a 2020. That's exactly right. Um, it's the most fun. How is that? Is that okay? Brilliant. Fantastic. Go for it. And, uh, and hopefully you're seeing my screen as well. Yep. We're seeing your screen. Okay. I will... Um... Okay. So look, I'll introduce myself and, and our organisation. My name is uh, Joe Portis. I've worked with Triple uh, R, a rapid response revival out of Sydney, Australia. Uh, we've been, we're, we're still in the startup phase, uh, but uh, in, uh, we're looking uh, to, for commercialisation, uh, certainly uh, based on regulatories over 2021. As I said before, this 2020 has certainly been interesting uh, for all of us uh, all over the world and especially when you're in a med tech startup uh, and you know there were some times there between April and July which I think we'll talk about forever. 
Uh, but certainly what I want to share with you today is uh, I, I work with an engineering company. I'm not an engineer, but, I'll, but I will show you how our strategy and uh, the commercial side uh, impacts um, our design philosophy and ensures that our uh, DNA stays true and, and to share some of the things we've learned and certainly some of the approaches and, uh, and, and sh certainly share our interesting story in the same process. So uh, which I'm assuming we're going okay here. So I'll um, uh, just go to the next slide. Is that working for us? Uh, so uh, we're in the business of uh, AED, so that's uh, in defibrillation. So uh, our purpose, and I think there's probably a better way to do it, uh, is to solve the unacceptably high uh, rate of sudden cardiac arrest in the world. Yeah. So uh, there is approximately every six seconds, someone dies of sudden cardiac arrest somewhere on, in the world. And it's a, a massive killer. I'm sure all of us that's in some way uh, have been impacted by this within family, friends, colleagues, and, uh, and that's certainly part of our DNA is our purpose. So whilst we don't you know, claim it, we still are a very much a purpose-driven organisation. And to solve the unacceptably high sudden cardiac arrest death rate by continual innovation and product uh, is really important. And when you understand our story, and often in busyness in times of detail and engineering, uh, if lost, I think your purpose and your, your actual reason for existing is your true north. So we're great believers in that. And when you understand our true north, uh, if lost in design and making decisions, even on business models, financials, uh, manufacturing locations, uh, to come back to purpose can reunite uh, all of our tribes uh, to get back on the same, onto the same uh, vision and journey. So it's a very important part of product development. You know? So what is, the, uh, what is the original reason for our company? And uh, then you can actually understand uh, how that flows through to design and engineering. Um, not of all we said, when you have a, an enigmatic founder, um, he, that won't always be explained. So it's very important to understand it um, before starting um, uh, on any innovative um, approach. So how we started um, is a, uh, about six years ago. Uh, actually, I've missed a slide. I missed a really critical one. Uh, Donovan Casey, who founded our business, uh, his wife, uh, had a sudden cardiac arrest at home. And like 80% of sudden cardiac arrests, it occurred in a home setting. It was midnight on a Saturday night, everyone was in bed, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, his wife went into sudden cardiac arrest. Now, fortuitously, Donovan knows CPR, and uh, then performed CPR and managed to call emergency line, the triple O, which is, uh, 911 in Australia, and the ambulance is on the way, and he actually was well trained and did CPR. Now, at around 15 minutes, which is, as I'll show you on the next slide, is an extraordinary amount of time survival, uh, the ambulance arrived with a defibrillator and uh, brought Sarah back. Uh, lucky, so she's one of the 3% uh, of the world uh, to come back after defibrillation. In that very moment, uh, and I'm happy to share the videos and the stories of this, in that very moment, Donovan, with his engineering mindset, uh, in sort of hyper-reality, if you like, said if they thought if there is a, uh, the defibrillator within two minutes of sudden cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest is an enormous problem all over the world, why isn't there one in every home? on every fridge, on every office in the, in the world, if this is so important uh, and so important in, as an intervention early, along with training and CPR, of course. So to understand that is actually really important. So the story, our story of uh, in that one moment of clarity in the possibly the most highest stressful moment of your life, uh, hence the vision of our company was born. And this flows through. So the idea being, well, most defibrillation has been around for a long time and the journey began in product development um, with engineers and a team of engineers who looked at current uh, technologies which hadn't been uh, innovated in for a long time. They're well-meaning, but difficult to use and aimed essentially at uh, uh, professional emergency service responders or those that are trained. Uh, I 
have said this before many times. I'm a, as an Australian, I am a, a surf lifesaver at Bondi Beach. 10 years training, I'm, I annually I'm learned how to do first aid, defibrillation and, and surf rescue. Yet, if I see a defibrillator that isn't the one I'm trained on, I feel incredibly nervous. Uh, and ability to act, despite being well trained, I'm, oh, do I know that model? And would have nerves uh, to intervene as a bystander, should that happen at, during uh, Christmas or end of year shopping. So, so there's a, a usability factor, and back to this very moment, um, to get it on every fridge in the world, uh, there needs to be four key dimensions in your design. So that is affordability. Uh, we could buy one now, and even living in, them, so, uh, in a very wealthy nation, spending over $1,000, people think three or four times before buying one for themselves. So affordability is absolutely key. Uh, and the key dimension in design, if you want to bring this to the masses, Yep, so we believe below $250, and Donovan did an enormous amount of research around um, uh, diffusion and, and new innovation coming into the world. So introducing a disruptive technology, um, what, at what price point is very important for it to uh, become a mainstream product? So rather than jump that, uh, to jump the chasm is the model we're using. Uh, pricing is incredibly important. So design, you need to understand this context and the vision of the company before you go into any uh, design phase, that we really want to make this available for everyone in the world on their fridge. So uh, really important also when we're negotiating yeah, with pricing and components and, uh, and part of our, uh, 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 any supplier will, will recognize this, that we're always trying to uh, get that affordability driven in uh, to our pricing. Now, of course, there is a natural conflict with margins and um, uh, not understanding that as a business side or if you've come in and a new CFO, when price uh, driving down is more important than margin and, and in any startup, I'm, I'm sure from all over the world will recognise that so the profit making is a very important um, misunderstanding or understanding of why we exist, uh, then it all starts to make sense again. So back to True North. Um, the next bit is usability. So uh, very important is uh, to make it usable. As I mentioned, even though I'm tr highly trained, uh, making this available, uh, I use my children. I have three children. Uh, could they use one? Um, if their grandparents uh, uh, were suddenly in, in issues, or dare I say their parents, uh, could they act? At the moment, no. But could we design something in a 13-year-old um, with minimal training, I uh, could also use. So usability and that barrier of having to be a professional is also important in our design. We've, uh, we've done a lot of work with usability studies, testing how much training you need, and we're, we will publish some in the next month. We've run a, a recent study with the uh, Federation University in Adelaide, Australia, and testing how much you can learn an online uh, situation compared to current AEDs. So that's incredibly important to us. Usability uh, and affordability, um, more so than having more uh, options or technical options. If uh, a 13 year old can use it simply in moments of pressure, incredibly important. You'll see as we use something, and, I, and if you can see my screen here, that's actually a, a prototype. Um, and that's uh, a way of getting down to how we actually well, want to use it. So, you, okay, we can see now. Yes, sorry, I'm on two, on two, I'm on two screens. Okay. Joe, you're I'm on the two same slide, is that okay? Yeah, that's all right, I'm still talking, yeah, that's fine. And um, so I'm just talking around, it's actually the story of the background there is very important. So um, here's the problem, as I mentioned before. So Sarah survived, if you have a look in there, after 11 minutes, uh, the chance of survival goes into the darkness. Most ambulances take over 11 minutes in any Western country or, uh, or, or advanced nation uh, to get there anyway. And we all have, live in big cities where traffic is horrendous. So most uh, ambulances are driving around for a lost cause. So as you can see, two minutes of chance of survival um, is around uh, a 90% success rate uh, early. So of course, that's just us being really clear on the problem at a personal level. 
Uh, the ambulance is also driving, uh, driving around and losing money as governments and local emergency services. Uh, that's our macro level. So very focused on what problem we're solving. Um, there's obviously the, the family, but there's also for governments to consider the overall economic impact of emergency services um, with, the, with the cost of ambulances, of course. Um, here's the design. So here's what we come against. Here's our traditional models. And, uh, and I believe that's, this is really important for us. So uh, as I said around design, it's a, uh, uh, we have to look at traditional models and they're aimed at professionals and they are still needed, by the way. The ambulance service still needs to use uh, high, high quality products. They're still there. It's actually the, the step between uh, the ambulance service arriving with their highly advanced technical products. We don't want to replace that and never will but it's actually the early intervention. So uh, somewhere in between the current and almost in, in our way of and our disruptive mindset is inventing a new category. So a new category of defib rather than actually going like for like. So uh, all important part of design, it's not actually trying to replace, it's actually uh, giving something before this actually arrives and, and uh, emergency responders can do their act. So again, that's a, uh, a solution I won't go to there and I will show you actually what the device ends up looking like. So we wanted to use and you can see portable is our other third dimension of design. So we feel if a, a cyclist or a, a family is going away and it should be able to fit in the, in the glove box of the car uh, or go in the car or in the on your backpack on going for a cycle. Affordable, uh, personal, so we see that as the future and the other piece that we think is important as design is designing it as if you were designing in 2020. So I know that sounds silly, but you know, with the internet of things and having something available, so when we snap, uh, it uses IOT to notify uh, uh, local emergency services, it gives you GPS location. And so using all of the wonderful tools in the world that are available to us in 2020, uh, not designing something from the year 1998, so make sure that it's all in there as we go forward. That's very important to, to pick up tech, to pick up, to use innovation and designing innovation into business models. We see software as a service obviously coming from the technology uh, uh, side of things, but certainly device as a service. Uh, when batteries run out, we can just replace for subscription is also something we see in the future. So disruption, uh, design and innovation into business models is also very important as well as uh, designing the actual device itself. All aligned, of course, because um, once this is all aligned and we are uh, designing products that fit the model, then uh, that's a, uh, our, our philosophy to go to market. Uh, other things we need to do with trainers, we see that obviously training is the most important thing if we want to solve sudden cardiac arrest. Um, how do we have a trainer? Uh, that's the box of the trainer. A simple, easy to use tool, toy-like, that 11-year-olds can practice. So the motor skills uh, uh, are there at, the, at that pressure moment rather than having to think what you want to do. And you see snap, peel, stick. Uh, we want that um, in your mind. So if you're in doubt, snap it, peel it and stick it on you. Uh, and then um, that at least takes away a lot of the pressure in the moment. So even simplicity of language, uh, sim uh, simplicity of design and usability of language actually comes into the design and the marketing and the packaging. Uh, inc incredibly important part of it. So um, I, I wanted to point that out because it links it back to our true north again. Um, there's other design pieces here, but, but, but considering we're actually designing MedTech and to take it to new markets, I feel I've covered um, a lot of the components that I wanted to cover in this session. Uh, and of course, happy to have a, a deeper dive later on. So I might hand back to you if that's okay, uh, Mutu, and um, uh, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you great. very much. Thank you so much for a great presentation from Mary, Jeffrey, and uh... Joe, wonderful. So I have a few questions here posted, so I'll just ask you them. Um, you talked a lot, uh, Mary, you talked a lot about technical viability, and often we tell this to startups, uh, technology is not the hardest part. Now you, you also talked a little bit about there's a lot more to do in terms of beyond technology. So can we sort of touch on those things? What all do they need to sort of focus on while they're doing these things? So maybe, uh, Mary, you can you can start off, and then Joe and Jeffrey can just uh, add on to that. 
Yeah, so thanks Mutu for the question. And actually, uh, I thought a lot of it was covered by Jeff uh, because he spent a lot of time going into you know, what the patient needs and all that. So uh, on technical feasibility, um, so what happens is uh, we've had some examples of our, our own project teams, you know, uh, working with external product design vendors. And typically when they go and see a design vendor, uh, they try and tell them all the technical specs and then expect uh, kind of the full product to be made. Uh, but then what we have, uh, the feedback coming back from these vendors is that um, they have not addressed the key question, right, which is the clinical value and what the um, efficacy they're trying to get at and what is the value proposition. And so uh, we have had to uh, work with our teams to actually try and dumb it down into more um, uh, component like uh, areas uh, to address the key risk. So for example, if you were trying to uh, perhaps uh, get at uh, getting a certain delta showing that this uh, application of uh, say a neurostimulation could affect a certain blood flow, for example, uh, that is the prototype that you need to create. A prototype that you could be tweaking neurostim parameters <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know, and assessing correct blood flow at the correct anatomical uh, position that you want, and so that is the the kind of prototype that you need to make, not the final product, and you know, on on what it will eventually look like, but really, can you address the key uh, technical question that uh, that can address the clinical unmet need? Uh, so that's where we find that um, we need to uh, you know try to get our teams uh, to think more critically. I think, uh, again, what Jeff said, right, um, find the two or three things that you need to do, right? Don't try and do everything. Uh, that's not possible. <laughs> so, so I think that's really the key learning, right, is distilling it down to the clinical value, um, the, 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 depending on who the payer is, right, who, uh, what kind of value you want to bring, and then uh, getting the technical questions solved for delivering that value. Yep. Fantastic. Jeffrey and Joe, would you like to add to that? You're on mute, Jeff. Jeff, do you want to add first? Yeah. Yeah, sure, Joe. Thank you. Um, so, so that was great, uh, Dr. Can. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I really, uh, you know, really resonated with me what what Joe was saying about usability as well. Human factors is extremely important. Um, there's a great book. Um, it's kind of the the standard is the use of everyday things, right? Uh, and and it's got to be intuitive. It's got to be something that's super simple. You can pick it up, know what you're supposed to do with it, and do it. Um, I like the fact that uh, Joe's product has has the instructions right on there for both adults and, and infants, and and uh, you know it's it's pretty clear. Three steps: one, two, three, um, and uh, it would be pretty pretty difficult to to mess it up, right? In other cases, like I mentioned, things like home hemodialysis. Um, you know, we've really got to look at human factors because somebody is at their home making their own dialysate. If it goes wrong, um, you know, people could die. And um, just putting tubes in the right place and making sure that that's worked out um, as, as they're making that dialysate can be really important. So in, in projects like that where things have to be what we call pokey yoked just perfectly, so you can't put things in the wrong place. You can't connect things incorrectly. Only the correct way works. Um, and then I also think about feasibility. Um, Feasibility is really important. Um, I'll, I'll put an article on the chat here that people can look up um, that I wrote for medical design outsourcing. And um, I looked at usability and kind of feasibility. And I, I called the term fusibility, right? If, if you can prove both of those feasibility and usability, uh, then you've got fusibility. And that, that gives you the opportunity to create a successful product. Uh, so feasibility includes market feasibility, as Dr. Can mentioned, clinical feasibility, and technical feasibility that you know has has the necessary technology solutions been proven uh, commercial feasibility is there a business plan that's going to be backed up by value propositions that are going to make sense so that it can be adopted and then also organizational feasibility right um and in a lot of cases right this is this is the one that can be broken um when i when i meet new entrepreneurs i also didn't mention that i sit on the screening committee for the boston harbor angels and their life science group so uh, when we see, you know, a lot of deal flow come through, it's pretty easy to tell if if an uh, entrepreneur has what it takes to go the distance. It's either going to be in their credibility by their um, by their education and the circles they hang out with, but also have have do they have team members that have been there before that have kind of gone through the gauntlet that have gotten all the way from a clean sheet of paper to market, uh, because that's a really important element of the team as well. Is that you've seen it, you you know what the dance looks 
like and you can do it again. Um, so, you know, we, we talk a lot about betting on the jockey and the horse, the jockey being uh, the entrepreneur and the horse being the technology. Uh, you can't get to market if either one of those two things is faulty. And so that's a really important thing to, to look at, whether it's someone on your board or someone as your advisor that, that's intimately involved in the development. Um, somebody has to have seen it before. Somebody needs to know the distance. But having a technical person that's not necessarily familiar with all the reasons why things can't work, um, that's not a reason for failure. Um, you can have individuals that don't necessarily know the rules. They break all the rules and they get there anyway, um, just from their tenacious nature. Um, and, and I've seen that happen as well. Um, but in order to uh, become you know, successful in, in developing and launching a product uh, for the market, um, you know, all of those kind of elements have to be addressed. Um, also, as I mentioned before, that vertical slice early, you know, developing a system that can actually perform the task that you're looking to do um, is really important. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Joe. And uh, again, thanks for, thanks for the opportunity to answer these questions. Uh, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, look, I will agree with uh, what you're saying around someone who has been there before, either commercially, but certainly um, on the board. Uh, so the board's been very important to us as we've grown. And, uh, we, and you've also got to play by the regulatory rules. So it's great being disruptive, but at least 50% of your uh, output is regs. And um, often that, if you are, have a disruptive mindset, uh, that's completely the opposite. Uh, an opposite point of view. So certainly managing uh, those conflicting forces is, is key. Uh, having a quality board of, of uh, who understands that is actually the important. And, and getting the balance right in experience, enthusiasm, uh, entrepreneurial spirit, and uh, understanding the referee's uh, decisions is, uh, is very key. And uh, balancing all of those in a startup uh, is very important as a risk uh, uh, element. Um, and commercial reality, of course. And, uh, and depending, you know, and I get sometimes when you're not in the States where there's uh, thousands of these around, it's to, it's to make the most of our current global rules. So you really need to come to uh, conferences, events, and meet people quickly and then build relationships. And um, I want to say on a positive note, I find people are really willing in this industry to have conversations. So uh, I have never had a problem in the world without talking to someone in the mornings or night times or any of our team and getting, you're not um, uh, locked into your local area. So, uh, and I think that's something that's been, uh, you know, uh, even the last 12 months probably made that even more easy than what it was before. So we can all talk on Zoom now as a standard rather than 12 months ago, you had to go to Singapore or Dusseldorf or wherever we we're going to actually meet people. So. Um, so that's certainly a risk. I know I've drifted off there, but um, we're taking the conversation to, another, to, an, to that next level anyway. So thank you. Fantastic. The interest of time, I have to hand it back to them as they've got the next one on. I, I, awesome. I've learned so much myself and it's been really, really enjoyable uh, interacting with all three of you. It's been fantastic and I hope it's been useful to our audience. Uh, it will be recorded so there will be others will be able to see and connect. Thank with you. you. So I hope you've enjoyed the morning or evening, whatever time it is around the lunch world. Lunchtime. Yes. <laughs> so lunch, dinner, and sleep time. So, yeah, so right. thank you so much. And I look forward to interacting with you. We are on for the rest of the week. We have a couple of sessions every, every yes. day. So if you could join some of them, it would be absolutely marvelous. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be in conversation with the three of you. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet 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 you. See you guys. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. See you, Mary. Thank you.